here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host, Nina Mishra. My guest today is Matt Bartolini, Head of Spider Americas Research at State Street Global Advisors. We're talking about the impact of 2024 election on your portfolio. Matt, welcome back. Uh, Great to have you with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me back. It's obviously a pretty big topic. I'm sure there's a lot of information out there. And hopefully we can provide some valued insights, particularly on some of the policies out there. Right, right. Uh, So the presidential election cycle is ramping up and investors are wondering what sort of policies are going to be enacted and what the market reaction is going to be and if there's anything they should do differently. And you published this uh, excellent 2024 U.S. election chart pack and ETF implementation guide. And uh, my biggest takeaway from this guide uh, was that time in the market is better than timing the market. That is something investors should always remember, whether during the election season or otherwise. But we'll come back to this point later. Uh, Mm -hmm. Let's start with the the impact of elections on stock market performance. So you looked at the historical relationships between uh, U.S. presidential elections and the performance of the broader U.S. equity market, uh, including party-based return patterns and market volatility. Tell us what you found. Yeah, I mean, I think largely the big takeaway is that while elections matter greatly, to us as individuals, they do not matter that greatly to the markets and the market's trajectory and its near-term performance, and more so its long-term performance. The research that we had done is going back to sort of post-World War II era to the 1940s and you know, try to I did just identify a couple key principles. And we always get the question of like, you know, should I be invested? It's an election coming up. Uh, should I get out of the market? It's really going to be volatile. And the research that we found is if you did a strategy where you um, sold the start of the election year and, and then bought back in, if you did that every year uh, or every election since 1947, you would have cumulatively underperformed in always invested portfolio by 9,000%. So back to your comment wow. about time in the market, it is more beneficial than timing the market. Also, timing uh, election results or party affiliation. Uh, there can be some asymmetric information in there that maybe leads you to believe that perhaps um, returns are better under full Republican control or returns are better under a um, Democratic president and Republican Congress. And, you know, when we do uh, sub-segment S&P 500 returns by some of these you know, party affiliations, you do see the data point where, yes, a Democratic president and Republican Congress uh, had an average return of 15%. But you know there are periods in time where it's not so much who is in party, but also what was going on during those sort of years from a cycle perspective. Because if you go and you look at, say, the 2006 to 2008 timeframe, what did you have? You had a Republican president and a split Congress. And all of a sudden, your worst period of return in that time frame coincided with the um, great financial crisis, which you could say there were some regulatory um, issues that led to that, but ultimately it had less to do with who was in the office and more so about exuberant risk-taking. And you see that even so on just, you know, different election years versus non-election years. You know, election year, if you look at the average returns in an election year, the average return back to 1947 is 7%. In a non-election year, it is 10%. So you can people could make the case that, hey, look, election year returns are weaker than non-election year returns. But again, look at what happened in 2008. It ha- you, that's an election year, and you were down 40%. So um, I don't think that is going to be a result that there was an election. It was because there was a financial crisis. Same thing within 2000. 2020, 
obviously is a uh, impact of a, an election year. So those are just some things to think about when you're looking at the overall um, data is that sometimes you're led to these sort of corner solutions. Right. So the best strategy is to just stay calm, stick to your plan and keep investing. And that said, uh, government policies are going to matter and uh, shifts in policies could lead to uh, specific investment opportunities uh, within particular sectors or the broader market. So let's talk about uh, policy differences uh, between these two candidates and uh, starting with taxes. Uh, so Kamala Harris supports raising taxes for corporations as well as high earners. And on the other hand, uh, uh, Trump has talked about uh, extending the Trump tax cuts. So please tell us how these policies are going to impact uh, the stock market and particular sectors. Yeah, so obviously, you know, taxes is one of those things where you do have diametrically opposed views and diametrically opposed positions. And I think writ large, you could say under a Harris administration, you're looking for a reset of a tax policy and higher tax rates, but also, you know, quadrupling potentially the amount that is levied for stock buybacks. So when we're looking at that um, taking place, you know, what would be a sector or industry or market segment of the market? that might be able to withstand or benefit under a higher tax regime, all else equal relative to um, other areas of the marketplace. So what we look for is that you know, sectors with more stable tax rates, sectors with limited buybacks, because they may be less impacted by tax increases, you know, they have more stability in their tax profile. At the same time, under a Harris administration, the plans are to provide accommodations and assistance to first-time home buyers and tax breaks to home builders. So how do you maybe lean into those areas? So consumer staples is a sector with a low amount of buybacks and a more stable tax rate relative to other sectors of the economy. Same thing, home builders. So an ETF like XHB, which is a modified equated exposure focused on home builders and housing retail firms, is one industry or one ETF that tracks an industry that is basically included in some of her tax policy platforms. So that's just one way on the, on the Democrat side. On the Republican side, it's you know the plans put forth on the, the campaign trail by former President Donald Trump it is ex- extending the TCJA tax cuts, so the T- Tax Cuts and Jobs Act from 2017, making some of them permanent. He's also suggested lowering the corporate tax rate further to 15%. So under this scenario, you want to look for sector, sectors with high tax rates, because if under a lower tax rate regime, their profitability could increase. At the same time, you know, if we're going to have lower personal taxes, that could increase consumption, benefiting retail-oriented industries. So in this sort of Republican tax scenario, it would be something like communication services. You know, the communication services, those firms have very high tax rates. They also have uh, high buybacks, right? So they would avert or you know, sidestep any sort of buyback tax that, you know, uh, Vice President Harris was recommending. And then also uh, retail. So a fund like XRT, some modified equal weighted exposure focused on retail firms. Uh, obviously, very focused on retail and consumption. If you have lower personal tax rates, that could uh, benefit as well from that perspective. Great. Now let's talk about trade and foreign policy. And uh, we could see a significant change in trade and foreign policy if Trump uh, comes back to power, um, because he is proposing to pose a 10% uh, tariff across all imported goods and uh, as much as 60% on Chinese good, goods. So tell us what that would mean for uh, uh, certain sectors. Yeah, so you know, trade is a, another one where it's not so diametrically opposed, but it is different. Um, both there's a little bit, you know, being uh, somewhat hawkish on trade, for both sides, but the details really do differ. You know, with a congressional makeup, a Harris administration is likely to maintain that status quo on trade tariffs that was was, was done under President Biden. Um, you'll probably see more um, 
uh, work done on coalitions and uh, coordination among regional counterparts and perhaps using subsidies to extend um, uh, benefits towards industries that are systematically important to our, our country. So under this scenario, if there's going to be less onerous tariffs, uh, a international exposures might get a boost, right? Because they're not going to be fearful of these retaliatory tariffs out there. Um, and then similarly, semiconductors. So a fund like XSD, which seeks to track that index or that market exposure of semiconductors, that is a uh, sort of systematically important industry in our country, uh, you may see some more subsidies towards semis. Conversely, on the Republican side, there's obviously a very fo big focus on tariffs. So here you'd want to look at more domestically focused markets, so small caps, and then also some service-based industries. Service-based industries typically do not have a significant amount of sales coming from overseas. They're more insular and more uh, domestically oriented. So um, they're not going to have uh, you know, impacts on global supply chains and transportation like those industrial sectors. Um, so that would be something, one of the ones that we identified was insurance firms. So again, just sort of referencing a fund at KIE, it's a modified equal weighted exposure focused on insurance firms as a very uh, uh, service-based industry. And it could be able to, you know, again, sidestep um, the impact on tariffs. Let's talk about the energy policy. And uh, this is an area where the two candidates differ significantly as, and a change of administration could mean a radical shift in an energy policy. Uh, so Harris is likely to prioritize climate policy and we are likely to see a continuation of clean energy spending and tax credits for EVs and Trump promises drill, baby drill for fossil fuels. Uh, so his victory would be negative for clean energy. Uh, but I have also seen some experts talking about uh, that any policy which favors more oil and gas production could drive fossil fuel prices lower. And uh, that would mean lower profits for oil companies. Uh, in fact, if we look at the performance of the energy sector, it uh, has risen about 143% since President Biden took office in January 2021. And uh, the best performance was during the first two years. So it's not really black and white uh, because uh, it also had the impact of the pandemic and then OPEC, uh, OPEC's response to it and then uh, sanctions on Russian energy following uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so tell us what you think uh, about the energy policies of these two candidates and their impact. Yeah, so um, on the energy one, this is actually kind of clear cut. One would favor uh, more clean energy, more renewable, sustainable infrastructure. So under Democrat part, a Democrat related party, um, you would see the uh, focus there um, on the more sustainable side. So that would benefit clean energy firms. It might also benefit um, electric vehicle firms, ones that are also are maybe using electric charging stations, so those advanced transport systems. So you really want to focus on the sustainable, renewable infrastructure firms, the sustainable and renewable clean energy firms as well. Uh, conversely, on the Republican side, I think what you would see is you know, the potential ex expansion in the size and scope of U.S. drilling auctions, and that could be done through executive order or repealing portions of the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. And that would just really sort of uniquely benefit the legacy oil and gas producers and services. Those large integrated U.S. energy giants, they could potentially see, potentially see some upside given a broader regulatory support for exploration activities of oil. So you know, that would be something like XOP, again, an industry ETF that focuses on exploration and production. So, you know, that's, again, this is, you know, uh, sort of a diametrically opposed view here too, where there's you know a left side and a right side with some clear implementation that uh, are clearly different. Right now, let's talk about an area where the two parties agree. One of the very few areas which is difference. Tell us what investors need to know. Yeah, so this one is pretty simple. Um, I think under both scenarios, you know, expect some 
some bipartisan support for increasing defense, just given what we're seeing on the, the global stage from a geopolitical conflict perspective. Um, you know, perhaps you know, there might be uh, more of a push under a Republican-led um, administration to get uh, NATO countries to spend more on defense, but I think all else equal, even if that does take place, defense spending um, would potentially um, go up under either scenario. So I think either your traditional defense firms or more future defense firms, uh, future security firms that are focused on cybersecurity, drones and border protection, you know, those could also uniquely benefit. And, you know, traditional defense industries, we have you know, XAR, it's a modified equal weighted exposure focused on that defense industry. You know, we've started to see some interest in that exposure because I think most folks are starting to coalesce around the idea that no matter who wins, the direction of travel is higher defense spending. Let's talk about regulation now. And uh, uh, Harris administration is likely to focus on limiting uh, these mega tech co companies' monopolies further. On the other hand, uh, Trump generally favors uh, less regulatory scrutiny. And uh, he's talked a lot about bringing crypto friendly regulations. So tell us how investors can prepare. Yeah, here for regulation. You know, we're, I mean, we're kind of seeing some of some of the playbook right now as it relates to big tech under the Biden administration and their Department of Justice, who have brought some antitrust uh, anti antitrust rulings uh, to Alphabet. And we've seen some impacts uh, to Apple as well. Uh, so, you know, again, here, you know, there's going to be more onerous uh, regulatory focus and antitrust legislation that could likely impact those mega cap tech conglomerates. And I think what that might do is lead to higher growth opportunities for the smaller innovative tech firms. So we would want to maybe, you know, uh, trade lower and go from your mega cap tech to something that's more equally weighted uh, across the entire innovative tech landscape. So, you know, we have KOMP, uh, which is a modified equal weighted exposure focused on firms driving innovation across the entire economy. So I think that's one way to sort of maintain that, you know, tech uh, sort of secular growth trade, but do it while you know, downweighting some of those mega cap tech conglomerates that could be, you know, really in the crosshairs of a um, a, a Harris administration that's focused on uh, regulating their sort of power and pricing power. Uh, then again, here sort of the inverse is true related to Republicans. They tend to enforce antitrust laws and review more mergers less stringently. Um, so, you know, I think what we've also seen a little bit here, again, to use this term, the direction of travel uh, is related to banks. You know, we've seen less onerous capital buffers are start to be put forth uh, in the chambers of, um, of Congress where you have Republican uh, control. So bank firms, uh, you know, KBE is our bank ETF. You know, those banking firms might all of a sudden start to have less stringent uh, scrutiny. Uh, of their capital balance sheet plans. And then on the last one, you know, the, uh, you know, Bitcoin and digital assets, you know, we've seen very favorable comments come from uh, Trump on the campaign trail, uh, you know, making the U S the Bitcoin superpower of the world. And, you know, if that does come to fruition, there is going to be a need, an ecosystem to support that. There's going to be a need for infrastructure for digital assets, for energy, for storage, for supercomputing and all the things that go around having a, you know, a country be a superpower. And so for that, you know, we've been having a lot of discussions around you know, how do you invest in the digital asset ecosystem? And, you know, we have our fund DECO, D-E-C-O. It's an actively managed fund focused on companies that stand to benefit from the growing adoption of blockchain and cryptocurrency industries. And it's actively managed by the firm uh, Galaxy. So, you know, I think we're, that under a Republican administration, you know, that type of ecosystem approach, you know, where you're trying to build a superpower could potentially be uh, quite beneficial. So let's move on from digital gold to real gold, because uh, gold has been surging this year. And uh, one of the reasons which is being mentioned is this rapidly rising debt and fiscal deterioration in the U.S., and that is one of the reasons why central banks are trying to diversify away 
from the US dollar. And this is an area where these two candidates, you know, neither of them is talking about containing the fiscal deficit. And in fact, no matter who wins, we are likely to see a larger fiscal deficit. So do you think the gold, that gold can continue its rally going forward? Yeah, I, I do. And I think, you know, you, you said it perfectly, you know, no matter who wins, expect a higher fiscal deficit. And, you know, if the TCJ, TCJA is extended, the deficit based on, you know, some of the projections uh, from the Congressional Budget Office just this summer said if, the, if that is extended, the deficit may increase by 0.3 to 0.5% just by 2026 alone. And what would that do is if you have an increased deficit, a wider deficit may spur additional central bank demand for gold as a reserve asset. And that's already been a buying behavior trend that has increased for 14 consecutive years. So if you have both campaigns out there talking about their policies that have a high probability of increasing the deficit, that would only more spur more buying from central banks to diversify their reserves away from treasuries in the dollar and go into gold. I think also, if you look at it and there's a split Congress, I think you would expect gridlock and increased tensions as you have debt increases and debt ceiling debates, uh, fiscal cliffs, and just overall broad-based gridlock. And I think even that would take place. You have um, potential tailwinds for the spot price of gold. And that's just talking elections and fiscal. If we bring in the monetary aspect to it, all of this is going to be occurring at the same time the Federal Reserve is likely to be cutting rates by, you know, based on the market projections now, another 175 basis points by May 2025. And as we know, in the months in which the Federal Reserve has cut interest rates, the spot price of gold has rallied by about 1% since uh, 1974. And if we have a decline in real rates, that performance only goes higher to about 1.6%. And we've had declining real rates as well. So there's a lot of tailwinds associated with the spot price of gold as we head towards election season and into 2025. Excellent stuff, Matt. Any final closing thoughts for investors? I mean, I think the big takeaway is that, you know, what I said at the top, um, elections matter greatly to us as individuals, but from a markets, broad market trajectory perspective, the S&P 500, if you will, um, it really tends not to matter that greatly. Uh, you will see some pickup in near-term volatility, maybe as some investors' nerves become a bit frayed based on all the rhetoric and things we see in headlines. However, that does quickly fade after the election and the market resumes, focusing in on how profits are being generated, how the economy is doing, and what are the valuations you're paying for those. Ultimately, that is how, what drives the market. And when we think about the policies put forth, if federal policies, if fiscal policies all of a sudden change the profit cycle for a specific sector and industry, that's when elections can matter, but it's very targeted, right? So going back to the defense spending argument, if there's an increase in defense spending, those aerospace and defense firms that receive that spending can potentially grow their profits. And if you're growing profits, that might be viewed positively from the market and you'll see price appreciation. So for me, that's how politics and policies impact profits in the market. Excellent stuff, Matt, and uh, perfectly put over there. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today and for sharing your excellent insights. Thank you. That was Matt Bartolini of State Street. Uh, now let's talk about some ETFs, starting with areas that will benefit no matter who wins. So gold has been doing very well. And if you are a long-term gold investor, then the best ETF is GLDM, charges just 10 basis points. It is the Spider Gold Mini Shares Trust. Of course, GLD is more popular because that is much larger, used by traders a lot due to its excellent liquidity. Now, talking about defense, that is an area where the two candidates agree on. The most popular ETF in the space is IDA, iShares US Aerospace and Defense ETF. This tracks a market cap weighted index, so obviously dominated by 
the largest companies in the space, including Boeing, which sometimes weighs on its performance. So if you want to take a look at an equally weighted ETF, uh, State Street has an excellent ETF. It is XAR, and the Spider S&P Aerospace and Defense ETF. Now, let's talk about some ETFs where uh, which may benefit from one of these candidates. Uh, so he talked about uh, tax breaks for home builders, which could benefit uh, the home building industry. And uh, uh, the two ETFs, the two popular ETFs in this space are uh, the iShares ETF, ITB, which tracks a market cap weighted index of home construction and related stocks. And uh, like many others, market cap weighted ETFs Yes, it is top heavy with just top four holdings accounting for about 45% of the portfolio. The equal weighted popular ETF in this space is XHB, which has a significant exposure to home building products and home furnishing companies as well. Now, uh, if uh, we see Trump back in power, then uh, High tax and consumer-oriented sectors could benefit from lower taxes. So the ETFs which are worth a look are XLC, which is the communication services the spider sector, and it is the most popular ETF in the space. And the retail ETF that which is worth a look is XRT, uh, which is also by State Street. Now, let's talk about the impact of regulation on some ETFs. Uh, so he mentioned that uh, a stringent regulatory framework could impact uh, large mega cap tech companies and non-large cap tech companies are likely to be less impacted by these more stringent regulations. And so you could take a look at an equal weighted technology ETF like XNTK, which is the Spider NYSC technology ETF. And another ETF that I like and is worth a look is QQQE. So it basically takes the holdings of the popular QQQ ETF and equal weights those holdings. Thanks for listening. If you like our show, please leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. Make sure to subscribe so that you do not miss any episode. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, please email podcast at zags.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.